Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. I'm Alex Payton. And I'm uh, Dr. Oliver Bridgewood. <laughs> Coming up this week, we've got a hot tech special of all the Paru based stuff, including all the latest gadgets out there. Including the adjustable inflation on the fly tech that Team DSM are using. But don't worry, we've also got all the usual good stuff, including the Bike Vault and the best bike shop in the world. First up, let's take a look at last week's poll. So last week we asked if you ever think graphene bikes will be mass produced. Yes, be patient, there'll be a thing. 43% of people mm. agreed with that, whereas 57% of people said, no way, can't see it happening. It's pretty close, that. It's pretty close. Pretty close, actually. pretty even, pretty even split. Yeah. Um, so on to this week's main talking point, which is cobbled classics tech. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had the tour of Flanders, which was amazing. But this Sunday, Sunday in hell, it's my favourite, the queen of the classics, Paris Roubaix. Now we see lots of tech coming into the forefront of stuff throughout the Cobbles Classic season, but Paris Bay is where we see all of the teams roll out all of their latest and greatest tech because the Cobbles are so brutal, aren't they? Yeah, I mean they're just they destroy equipment. They're just punishing and really tough to ride, and that's the reason why I, I, I love it so much. It's going to be on GCM Plus. Territory restrictions apply. But if you've many of you I, will have watched it before, but if you've never watched Paris Roubaix, like. I implore you to do so. That's it's, incredible. It's just the best race. It is. It's my oh, favourite one day so race. So unpredictable. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one of the big tech trends of, of Pyru Bay has been well, increasing in tyre width. Now, at the rate we're going, they seem to increase like every sort of couple of years. Yeah. To the point where in 10 years' time, they're probably going to be on like 60 millimetre tyres. But at the moment, it seems that 30 millimetres. Is, is the preserve and what most riders are going to be using. They fully expect the old riders to probably be on 32s. Yeah, actually, talking about tyre width, last week Manon and I were out at Peru Bay, Arenberg Forest, one of the most famous sectors, looking at the difference of different types of bikes and different tyres using. And I mean, it's pretty clear to see why the tyres are much nicer to ride on the cobbles. But like you say, I think this year we're going to see 30 mil almost as the standard. Maybe some teams push it out to 32 mil. Mm -hmm. So both Lizzie Dignan and Sonny Colbrelli, the winners of the men's and women's races last mm -hmm. year, both used 30 millimeter tubeless tires. Yeah. Which I think is pretty significant. Very significant. Um, and that was probably a key part of why, why they both won. They didn't suffer punctures in the race, or if they did, they sealed. Lizzie um, was riding the Pirelli um, TLR P0 tires. Yeah. And Sonny Colbrelli was riding the latest Continental, the GP5000 STRs. Yeah, and we've, seen also Vittoria sponsored teams yeah. in the last couple of years use their tyre liner tech inside tubeless tyres so it's like a run flat system but there could be an even bigger like game changing piece of tech about to drop in the form of this it's called the Scope Atmos it's going to be used by Team DSM check it out it's a device that fits onto the front and a separate one onto the rear hub of your bike. And it costs 4,000 euros. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And it allows riders to adjust the pressure of their tires on the fly, either lower it or increase it, which is incredible. And this is done by way of manual buttons attached onto your handlebars. And then you can read the pressure that you've got in your tires on your head unit which is amazing. This is a pretty cool bit of kit that we've got here. So the main sort of charged unit part sits on the hub and then that is connected to the tire of the rim via a small little hose, which presumably you run like upside the side of a spoke to keep it all neat and tidy. And then that charged unit is then what puts the air from that up into the tire. So allowing you to change the tire pressure. And I would assume in order to lower the tire pressure, it just bleeds a little bit of that air pressure off. Now, presumably back into the into I, the I don't know if unit. it does go back into the system, that would be super impressive. Mm. But I don't think it's going to because the pressure that the main system is at is obviously going to be much, much higher than the pressure that the tyre is at. So I reckon it'll have to like bleed that air off and then eventually the canister in the centre will be like depleted of its pressure yep. and then you just charge it back up again. So the reason why this could be a game changer is because tyre pressure is absolutely crucial at Paris-Roubaix. 
And invariably, the pressure that teams and riders run is a compromise. It's a compromise because you want to have a low pressure so that you can have comfort and grip on the rough and slippy cobbles, but you don't want it too low because then on the tarmac road sections, which is the majority of the race, you will then have a big rolling resistance penalty because your tires aren't inflated enough. No. So by doing this, well, the idea, and it, it makes total sense, is that then you can inflate your tires once you get onto the road sections, run them at higher pressure, and therefore eradicate that rolling resistance penalty from having soft tires. It's a pretty good point. What I was gonna say was, in terms of the proportions of the split of road and cobbles, so in the men's race in Paris Bay on the Sunday, it's about 80-20, so 80% road, 20% cobbles. Whereas in the women's race, you've got a shorter overall race distance, and the split goes slightly higher towards cobbles, so it's 25%. 75%. So that's why it's so crucial that you've got the ability to change those pressures because it's a, it's a big chunk of the race, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of like downsides of it, it's going to add a little bit of weight. Yeah. But Paris Bay is a largely flat race oh, yeah. and so riders are notoriously not bothered about weight on it. It yeah. makes a minimal amount of difference. Bigger penalty is likely to come from the increasing the size of the hub. Uh, and that creating an aerodynamic penalty. So the little hose that's linking up? Yes, which, you know, it's maybe a couple of watts that you're losing there. It's going to be effectively like a slightly larger spoke, isn't it, really? Yeah. yeah. But the, um, well, the makers of this scope, they, they reckon that the difference in sort of the worst case scenario to the best case scenario with using this tech can be a 30 watt saving in rolling resistance. Now that is a huge saving if their numbers are representative of what riders will see in yeah, the race. That's but, a big claim. Yeah, it is a big claim. And on the face of it, I'm going to assume that I think the, the realistic numbers that riders will see in the race will be a little bit more conservative. Yeah, I, I think maybe 10 to 15 watts, if they said that, I'd be like, oh, I can believe that. Yeah, because they've, the they've already got a pretty optimised setup, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Now, I know what you're sat at home thinking, and that is that, don't worry, the UCI are probably going to ban this, but Scope have already thought about this, and they've actually got this product signed off and approved by the UCI already. I mean, according to UCI regulation 1.3.004, it's allowed <laughs> if it's in. I've got the article here. Should we read yeah, through it? Go for it, yeah. Right, so where's it gone? Right, so UCI regulation 1.3004, as you kindly reminded us. The tyre pressure management system is controlled by buttons on the handlebar and uses mechanical valves to regulate airflow between the air reservoir and the tubeless tyre. The UCI release reads, the system does not alter the structural integrity of the wheel set and does not contain any moving parts or compressors. Um, All right. If it doesn't contain any moving parts, I'm not sure how it actually works. Wizards, there's a wizard inside. Just a little miniature wizard. Just the actual science. Yeah. No magic. wonder it's 4,000 euros, there's yeah. a wizard inside every yeah. time. Yeah, well, anyway, I mean, that's not the only uh, sort of key bit of tech. No. I think another, in terms of a more general tech trend that we've seen with Paris Bay is far less specialist bikes are being used. And this is something that really kicked off with, well, Matt Heyman's sensational win in, in 2016, in which he just used his regular race bike, which was, at the time was a Scott Foil. That's incredible. Yeah, and it was an aero bike, which there was obviously an advantage, most most of the yeah. speeds that they ride at, and most of it being on road, there's a big advantage there. And then we've seen you know, other riders then using just their regular race road bikes, yeah. like uh, Badenpool on his Canyon Air Road. Yeah, you see, you go back Colt a few Rally years. on his Reactor last year. Go back a few years more, and that's when we did see lots of teams like rolling out their special cobble bike just for this event. Yeah. Whereas now, that trend's kind of faded a little bit. Yeah, I mean, you'd have special bikes with added compliance, you know, slightly different geometry. And suspension. Suspension features built yeah. in. And while we do see a few of these still, markedly less, and most people just use their existing bike. Part of that is because I think the move to disc means that we've naturally been able to have much bigger tire clearance on most bikes. Yeah. Because calipers just didn't have the clearance. Yeah, then the main bit, they restricted the tire with that and frame design. Whereas, like you say, go to disc, designers can be pretty much free reign. What yeah, so doing. most people can put 30s in. Although, having said that, an important difference would be Lizzie's win last year on her Trek de Marnay, which yeah. is a the classic cobble bike bike. Bit bike more trek. compliance, bit more stable across the cobbles. Yeah, well, yeah. it's also it could have been an instrumental reason in her winning. I mean, when she was away and she was slipping and sliding all over the mud, yeah. the fact that she had a bike that had a longer wheelbase and, and a slightly more sort of stable geometry with regards to like the rake and stuff, yeah. that probably did help her 
in being more stable when she was slipping and sliding. I mean, still to mud. this day, that, that clip of her sliding across through the cobbles... And keeping it up. That's one of the best things I've ever seen. Amazing. I mean, if we can play that on the screen now, that'd be incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Another change we often see, and it's one we've documented before, is, is bigger gearing. It's a mostly flat race. Yeah. And so we often see sometimes bigger outer chain rings, maybe like a 55 or a 56. But then also the, the bigger ring, the inner ring, is often bigger as well. So a 39 often upgraded to say like a 43 or a 42 is quite a, quite a common thing, especially on Shimano-sponsored teams. But we may also see some one-by setups. Yeah. Um, Lizzie won on one by last year, and one by kind of makes sense for a race like Paris Roubaix because it's not hilly, and well, it's you just don't it's need more, to use it's more aerodynamic. Trainer. Yeah, it is. Now talking about the gearing and chain sets that teams are using, I was reading an article earlier in the week where some team mechanics were reporting issues of more frequently dropped chains. Now I think what they're referring to is the fact that some teams, due to the sort of limited supply of parts, mm. are using 11-speed Shimano chain sets on the 12-speed group sets. Because that's all they can get at the Yeah, moment. that's all they can get. They've got no other options. So it'll be interesting to see if this is something that rears its head over the brutal cobblestones, or if everything's just going to work out all right. If there's any race where you're going to drop a chain, it's Paris <laughs> yeah. Bay. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, but, well, Lizzie used a, a, a rather substantial chain catcher on her bike last year, K-Edge 1. Yeah, big and aluminium yeah, catching machine She wasn't machine alone, thing. like a lot, of other, a lot of other riders installed special chain catches just for this race, so I guess, guess we'll see. have to keep her eyes peeled for won't we? Mm. Another bit of cool tech which you were telling me about earlier, which I'd never heard of before that the, the teams use, but it's something that the, the teams are using in the actual team cars, yeah. so the DS is using it, and it's a, a VeloViewer thing. So right? it's called VeloViewer World Tour. Now, VeloViewer is a platform that allows you to look at different routes and climbs, but they do a World Tour package, which enables the, the, team, um, the team DSs in the team cars to have maybe on an iPad or whatever display, which gives them the route and all of the information live and in front of them, and they can plan out key sectors where they want riders to be at the front. It gives them live weather information, Basically, it gives them everything they could possibly need to know about the route live updated in front of them, and then they can relay all of that information to the riders using the race radios. Now, they can't actually send this information from the app direct to the riders because it's against UCI rules, but it does give them a real clear pinpoint of information and in key sections within the race. And they can upload all of that information in advance to the rider's head units, but they can't change it on the fly, sort of live updated. It's quite yeah, a cool bit of tech, That is really it? cool. It'd be cool, wouldn't it, if they can see like the rain coming in later on in the race, so they can then call domestics back to give them like rain jackets and then can take them to the leader. And... Yeah, so you can almost try to get a little bit of a step ahead. Now mm. also, the teams are using this in terms of having a car that's ahead of the race, so they can have the app running in a car that's maybe 20 minutes ahead of the race, going through the route, and then that can update any information that that sees before the race arrives, relay it back to the team car, and then it can be relayed to the riders. Yeah. So it's all pretty clever stuff, really. That is very clever. I think an important thing to remember is that m marginal gains really do matter, and they really do add up in a race like Paris-Roubaix. Aero really does count. And, and a great example of that was the incredible finish oh, yeah. to Amstel Gold. Um, last week, last weekend, yeah. That so, was blooming good. Yeah, so if if you if you missed it, you can catch up on uh, on demand on GCM Plus and check it out. But uh, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> it was between Benoit Cosnefoy and Mikhail Kvyatkovsky, and the the winning margin was like that much. And well, they called the result wrong to start with, didn't they? Well, one of them was wearing a skin suit, and one of them was wearing shorts and a jersey. So guess who won? Yeah, go figure. <laughs> anyway. Um, but it does highlight that marginal gains are important in all races, whether they're like on the velodrome or brutal cobble classes. Like yeah. Now, I'll tell you what we should do now. End of hot tech for the Parry Base so special. We should have a poll, because I want to know if tyre pressure tech, like we've discussed, is going to be a game changer, and is it going to affect the result in Parry Bay? No voting in this poll after Parry Bay has happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll count, we'll count the results yeah, at the yeah, end. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's enough waffle about Paru Bay. It's now time for regular hot tech. Starting with a new cask Protone helmet. So the Protone, it's been around a surprisingly long amount of time, like eight years. Yeah. And in that time, four Olympic gold medals, 10 grand tour, that's a successful design. It is. And I'm, I'm a fan of it, I think it looks cool. And they've just updated it and brought out a new version called the Protone Icon. And I mean, to the untrained eye, it looks Pretty similar, it's quite hard to tell the difference. It's got a revised structure though to improve the airflow to cool your head and improve the overall aerodynamics of the helmet. 
So this has got a new retention system called the Octofit Plus. Now this helmet doesn't have the MIPS system in it, but according to Cask, it meets the same safety standards as what you would get from that MIPS system. Yeah, and uh, it's 230 grams in a size medium too. So about similar to what it was before. Hmm, nice helmet that, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. Next up, Sturdy Bikes, made by uh, our mate Tom Sturdy, yeah. which you may have seen in several videos, the custom titanium bikes made down in Froome. Just down the road from me, actually. In Tom's shed. Yeah. Uh, well, he's now partnered with Classified, which is, which is part of a bigger story, really, in that Classified is now partnered with over 250 sort of authorised dealers and brands to sort of exclusively use their Classified system on their bikes, which it's pretty cool. It's good to see the classified system gaining more and more traction and seeing more and more bikes include it. Because if you're unfamiliar with it, Cy did an amazing video on it, but it, it does away with the front mech. So you have your front mech in your rear hub. Yeah. That's clever. It gives you another option when you're specking your custom titanium 3D printed bike, doesn't it? Nice. Hmm. We've got some new Bianchi tech next. So this is the Bianchi Specialissima and it's the 105th anniversary edition to celebrate the 105th anniversary of the Giro. So it comes in a super fancy pants gift set where you get your frame, your forks, you get a pink jersey, you get an authenticity card and also you get a little card which shows the certain pigment, the special colour of the paint. Yeah, it's called like En Rosadera. Yeah. It's the, it's the shade. Yeah. The fancy Italian shade. Now, it's, it looks very nice. I've got some information on that actually. Yeah. So according to Bianchi, um, it's on the detailing on the fork and the frame, and it's picked out, um, so Bianchi picked out the colour, specially created, and it's to do with representing the light of the Dolomites at dawn or dusk when the peaks seem to have a haze of red, gold, and especially pink, which yes, is the colour of the Giro. It's, I mean, it's the most beautiful place in the world. I really love the Dolomites. Um, but also, the, the Specialism is a cool bike. It's like, there's not many bikes around now that are still being made by the big brands that like have that classic silhouette of like the sort of fairly flat top tube and you know not dropped seat stays and yeah. stuff. So. It's sort of almost like a traditional design. Mm. So there's only going to be 105 of these available, each one individually numbered on the top tube. And if you do want one, you need to join the waiting list. I think they launch tomorrow, and you're going to need to have a handy 5,400 euros in your back pocket. Final bit of hot tech this week, and it is a super fancy pants bit of technology for you, right? This is essentially a remote fob to activate your electronic garage door that fits in place of a Shimano Di2 junction box on your bike, so you can put it into the ends of your handlebars. So you ride up to yeah. your garage door and you just go, beep, and it opens. Legit, for real. Absolute baller. Um, it has a range of, I think it's about 50 feet or something, and it says it's compatible with 90% of garage doors. Oh, that's a shame. I've got 10 garage doors at my house, yeah. so one of them it's not going to work with. That's a bit of a down, downfall, that, for you, yeah. isn't it? Um, anyway, it weighs only 16 grams, and according to the manufacturers, it has a battery life of around a year. So you'd be good for a year. Hmm. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Happy uh, days. More hot tech next week. Yeah. Huh? Quick bit of uh, housekeeping is oh. Global Bike Festival reminder, right? Yeah. Loyal tech show viewers, you guys. Yeah. If you shh, don't tell anyone, Duh. if you if you go and buy festival tickets, I can give you a discount. Use the code Ollie twenty five. You get twenty five percent off your Global Bike Festival ticket. Can I use it as well? You can, yeah. Oh, thanks, mate. I don't have my own discount code. Sorry, if one. I... You should use Ollie's. <laughs> It's now time for the best bike show in the world this week. According to us. Now, this is the part of the show where you get to champion your local bike shop. Bike shops, they're integral to cycling culture, and we want to support them, and we want your help. So if you have a bike shop that you want to nominate as the best bike shop in the world this week, then simply go into the GCN app, submit some photos, and as much information as you can about why this bike shop is the best in the world. Submit it under other. In, in the app. And then also make sure you mark it with the hashtag bike shop. That yeah. way we can find it. Yeah, anyway, yeah easy for us. Which right. is the best bike shop in the world this week? This week, there's a submission from Andy Pedals Andy and Pedals. says he would like to nominate pro bikers on the old Mamalapuram Road in Chennai, India. Wow. So, says a great team will go the extra mile for you. Here they are. Wonderful. There's Just... pro bikers in Chennai. Look at, I love wow. the way that they're so regimented and drilled. They look like a boy band. <laughs> they do look like a boy band. They're all in sync. Oh, it's that really With bad the... boy, jam, boy band joke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, it's, I mean, you can clearly see that this bike shop is impeccably clean yeah. because the, the guy on the far left yeah. is just wearing his socks. That's how clean the floor is. Yes. 
Well, um, look at this. So they have obviously serviced someone's Pinarello Dogma. Check out, they've laid all of the parts out. That's incredible. That's the sort of level of service they go through. Um, Chennai, Ch home of the Chennai Super Kings IPL team. Yeah? You, you, you a fan of them? Um, if I'm honest, I don't know what sport you're even talking it's about. MS Dhoni's team. <laughs> also, Chris Jordan plays for them as well. Oh yeah, I know him really well. Good English bowler, that lad. <laughs> Good English bowler. Um, um, loads of cool pictures on their Google Maps page. Loads of detailed bits and some really great reviews from very satisfied customers. I also saw that the, the, the sort of the best musical prodigy, child prodigy in the world, yeah. had visited the shop and played played there. Played the piano. And got a, got a bike there. Six weeks ago, according to their Instagram page, um, some lovely melodies they were playing. Yeah. Really like that. Can we play that? We can probably play it. Let me turn, turn my volume up. Oh. This was live in the bike shop. Wow, that's not... This is why it's the best bike shop in the world this week. Yeah. Incredible. You find me another bike shop where someone's played the piano live, I'll put it in the text show. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, should we go into the bike vault? Yeah. Yeah, come on, let's do it. Right, so it's now time for the bike vault. This is the section of the show where you upload images of your bikes, myself and Ollie, then judge them to be either nice or super nice. If they're super nice, I find the bell from underneath our table. I ring it and it goes into the bike vault for eternity. Yeah, and you can uh, submit your bikes in the GCN app under the bike vault section. Um, yeah. And you can vote on all the bikes featured as well. So first up, what was the most super nice bike last week, Alex? Oh, I've got to hang my head in shame. It was you. Of all the thousands of bikes that were submitted, me. You. My bike was uh, the most super nice. But what, I, yeah, I'm not surprised actually, because I'm going to say it's a joint effort. I actually took the picture. He did, yeah. While we're at um, Landau Circuit. Yeah. This yeah. is my bike. It's for an up and coming video. Um, yeah. And it's in full Zwift mode. It is full Zwift mode. That's like how 90% of the bikes in Zwift look. Anyway. <laughs> Um, um, well done, mate. Congratulations to you. I'm going to super nice it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> right, first up this week, we've got Ronin Bugoyeta. That'll do. This is as good as I'm going to get. I'm sorry. Trek 1200. And Check it out. Wow. It's looking, I mean, it's a, it's a very nice bike. I do like You know, that, that, like that sort but... of era and that style of bike is it reminds me of when I was a kid racing. That was sort of like the bike used to go into the shop and look at all the time. Yes, I mm. do think the cables need, there's a bit of cable management required. There's just too many breaches of the rules here, but it's a very nice bike. If I mean, if they send us a nice message to someone at GCN Megabase, maybe we should send them a water bottle so I have to use yeah. a disposable one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, try your luck, fingers crossed. Um, next up, we've got Whaley Dish. <laughs> yeah. With his Cannondale Super 6 Evo High Mod from 2013. Classic. Oh, that is a classic. I mean, that's a super nice. Yeah. Super nice in it. Hit it. He's not in Biggie Smalls, but I'm super nice in it. It's clean, it's good. I'm digging it. Clean, clean photo. Digging it. Um, Sheltzy next with his Daily Commuter, which is a bomb track, bomb track hook. hook. E X T dash C. That, uh, that is a, that's like what is an this incredible thing? Daily Commuter. Is it got a koala bear zip tied onto the um, to the top of the seat stays. Are oh, my eyes deceiving me? I'm going to have to zoom this to 200%. <laughs> I think that's super nice. I think that's a super nice. Uh, I'm going to reserve my judgment just yet. Yeah, super nice. Mostly for the koala bear. Oh, maybe I need a tech magnifying glass. Yep, yeah, super nice. Dive for pearls next with his um, Wabi Special. What is this thing? Interesting. I mean, incredible monument. Is that somebody surfing? Yeah. It's, okay. um, cranks aren't level, but it no. looks like it's a fixie. And so in which case, that's there's a special fixie dispensation. I'm going super nice. I think that's a really smart looking bike. It is a smart looking bike. Digging I'll super nice that. It's, it's, it's clean, it's plain, it's simple. Super yeah. nice. Next up is Rosanne Kelly with his and, and hers. I've got 18. His and hers, oh. husband and wife. God, maybe Chloe and me will get matching bikes. Matching TT bikes. Matchy, matchy. I think we've got to go super nice on this. Are we going to hit another super nice? I think so. His and hers matching TT bikes. That's, pr that's, that's pretty cool, yeah. isn't it? I mean, what a time to be alive. Wow. I mean, I have, I've literally I've made no assessment of this picture whatsoever. No, I, haven't. I, was I just thought it was a cool idea. I hope people are going to get angry in the comments. Uh, 
Malte Lindholm yeah. Ridley Helium SLX disc, 7.3 kilograms. As pictured. Ooh. I like this. Lovely stained sort of garden storage area. I tell you what, he's been using the uh, the, the the jet wash on his on his paving there. Yeah, hasn't he? They're they're very clean. They can come around my house, get them, do this little back garden. I mean, that's there is one little weed just under the chain set that he's missed, oh. but um, otherwise. So valves are aligned. We're in Biggie Smalls. Cranks are aligned. It's There's easy. No it's, I mean, it's super nice. It's easy. He's made life easy for us. Yeah, he's made life easy. Uh, next up, we've got E3 uh, oh, yeah. uh, with um, a Kestrel. A Kestrel. It was a Kestrel, um, one of the brands that made the first carbon road bike. No, it's also a small uh, bird of prey, <laughs> yeah. often found on the sides of roads above hedges hovering. Yeah, that didn't design the first carbon road bike. Mm. Mm, okay. Well, I like this. I like the colour. The bar tape has got a very like '90s vibe to it. Yeah, it's um, it's it's. I'm going to supernise that. I'm supernising that Kestrel. I can't find a valid oh, okay. reason not to. Oh, yeah. Kez. Right. Well, that's, that's it for the, the bike vault this, this week and the, and the show. Yeah. What a shame. Don't worry, we'll be back next week. Yeah. Same time again. If you've enjoyed, then subscribe. Help support the show and the channel. It's much appreciated. And remember, if you do want to come to the Global Bike Festival, use my top secret code, Ollie25, and you get 25% off. Love you. Bye. <laughs>